Oh, really? Wow. All right. Good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Close proximity as opposed to across the, across the hall. Um, we are here this morning to hear two, well, two, from two witnesses, uh, Representative Wood, Chair of the Human Services Committee, and Representative Kornheiser will be here at 1030 to discuss the Ways and Means Amendments, um, or Amendment, I think it's Amendments, I think it's plural. Um, basically, our process for this morning, I understand that some folks need to go out for other testimony or other things. We need to vote on this before we go on the floor today. So if you have um, my, I think what I would need to do is hear the testimony, get us all back together, as many of us back together as 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 are here or would are coming to committee, and then um, do the straw poll votes then. That, does that make sense to people? I don't want to rush any particular conversation if people have to leave, you know, come and go. Um, but I would like to have as many committee members as possible vote on the amendments before we go, for noon, essentially. Um, so today's schedule, we don't know. I know there's conversations that are still happening on possible amendments to this bill, and we just have to be ready to, to react to those when they come forward. And we are looking at another long day, I think. Um, so just be ready. To, I think if we have to hear amendments during the day, then we will um, have permission to come off the floor to do that. With that, Representative Wood, welcome. Um, so, and also committee, this is, um, this process on this bill, we basically we did our we did our bill, which was a policy with appropriations requests. Uh, as part of the framework, we then assigned uh, we gave this bill we committed this bill to Human Services, and they have the amendment that they'll be sharing with us are instances of amendment which is a little bit different than sometimes we do, every committee does a strike call. And it's the same thing is gonna happen with the Ways and Means Committee amendments as well. So keep that in mind as we're hearing um, what Representative Wood will be responding to is our bill with suggested changes. Exactly. Thank, Thank you, you. we're well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Teresa Wood from House Human Services. Thank you for um, hearing House Human Services proposed amendments to H829. Um, first off, thank you for taking up a um, plan um, that is sort of the first one that we've seen really that uh, attempts to bridge the gap between what we have now and what we need for the future in terms of housing. And so um, we are appreciative, appreciative of that um, from our committee. So um, I won't, you know, belabor it. I'll just uh, kind of go into what it is that it is that we are proposing. And uh, keep in mind that uh, we looked at this with an eye towards people of very low income, uh, even lower than what this committee typical typically, you know, reviews as low income, uh, and sometimes people with no income whatsoever. Um, and uh, so um, we sort of had that mindset in terms of how we looked at things. And then there were a couple of things in here that just um, sort of seemed a little peculiar. So we took an attempt at um, trying to trying to rectify that. So in the first um, instance of amendments in section one um, in subdivision A8, um, and we just inserted the word affordable. Pretty straightforward. Uh, in our second instance of mm -hmm. amendment in section two, um, in subdivision A4, um, uh, this is where the um, uh, Department of Housing and Community Development was talking about 
a reasonable percentage for administrative costs um, to implement the program. Uh, and there, this appears in a couple of places in the bill. And we thought like, well, um, our committee in particular had some concerns around being clear about what reasonable, you know, reasonable to Rep. Stevens and reasonable to me or to Rep. LeBounty might be three different things. And so um, we just felt that we sh probably shouldn't leave that up to interpretation. And so um, we did ask the, the department, uh, the commissioner, for uh, what uh, they would see in that in terms of what their definition of reasonable was. Um, we did not get that back in time. Um, you know, this bill needed to move along on its merry way um, through the rest of the committees. So uh, we inserted up to a cap of 5%. Um, so you will see that um, in two different places. Um, our third instance of amendment is in subdivision A5 um, by striking out the word political and just inserting a lieu thereof um, governmental unit. Um, uh, people upstairs felt like that was referencing political parties. I didn't think that it was, but this the uh, ledge council said governmental had the same meaning as what was intended. I, I do want to... Um, uh, back up and say that um, after we voted this out of committee, um, uh, Commissioner Farrell did had forwarded to me um, what their suggestion would be for language, um, and uh, it was up to ten percent and a uh, not to exceed a dollar maximum. And he said the dollar maximum, but I don't have it off the top of my head. So I do want to say that um, after we had voted this amendment out, he did provide that information. So I can provide that to the chair if you're interested. Okay. Um, uh, in the fourth instance of amendment in subdivision E, it, it, there's a lot of letters, E, 2, A, I. It's, it, those all get very confusing. But um, when uh, it's referencing uh, exiting homelessness, um, we uh, wanted to include the concept of master leases, particularly for um, youth. Um, uh, up to age 25, um, because that can be a, or it has been proven to be, in our experience, a useful tool in order to assist individuals and to assist landlords in um, renting to younger individuals who may not have a uh, either a decent credit history um, or any kind of length of credit history. And so the concept of securing housing through a uh, master lease held by youth service providers such as Spectrum or other providers like that, they have found that to be helpful. And so um, we inserted language um, to reflect that as um, I don't think it changes the intent, uh, it just adds, adds another um, component. And so uh, without it up on the screen, I just wanna talk that through. So this is a section where these are the program requirements for VHIP. And so section one says the landlord should coordinate with nonprofit housing partners and local coordinated entry organizations to identify potential tenants. And then section two reads, except as provided in subdivision 2B of this section, subsection E, a landlord shall lease the unit to a household that is one exiting homelessness. That's where this change is being this is the language being added to that section. Section two is actively working with an immigrant or refugee settlement program for three. And this is what language that we added composed of at least one individual with a disability who's eligible to receive Medicaid funded home and community based services. So, so this is extending the definition of exiting homelessness. And uh, um, thank you for pointing out that out, uh, Chair Stevens. I also want to thank the committee for including the inclusion of the um, element around individuals who are eligible for home and community-based services. Um, uh, that's a particularly, um, it's, it's not a huge group of individuals within the state, but they are a group, which I know your committee has heard from in the past, uh, as has our committee, that um, feel particularly underrepresented in the housing market right now. So. Um, and in housing development. So um, we appreciate your attention to including those individuals um, in the in this. Um, 
So the, um, the next amendment, um, uh, it, it looks long, it's, it's not really long, but it's, it's taking what is in the five-year forgivable loan category. And again, remembering um, that uh, this is under VHIP once again, um, that has been um, very successful in rehabilitating uh, rental units um, and for access of people who are exiting homelessness. Um, you all know that it's a cost-effective way to do that, uh, and it's faster than trying to build new units. And so we need sort of the, the array of different things, and this bill does represent an array of different things. Um, however, in the 10-year forgivable loan um, portion of the BHIP program, there's no reference to um, the prioritization of people exiting homelessness. And essentially what our committee did was to uh, take everything that was in the five-year section and also include it in the 10-year section so that priority will be given to people who are exiting homelessness. Uh, and if those are not available, then you know down the line um, as it exists in the five-year um, program. So um, again, focusing on um, our... Uh, our aim to reduce the number of people who are experiencing homelessness. So um, then we move to, uh, that was fifth, then we move to um, the sixth uh, instance of amendment. And um, this is with regard to the uh, concept of resident, uh, sort of residential managers, if you will, um, that housing uh, providers uh, the success, successful housing providers really have uh, engaged these individuals in assisting people within their uh, housing to um, access different services, to provide assistance with transportation and figuring those kinds of things out to serve as a resource really at the housing unit. Um, our committee um, uh, supports that. Um, however, also thought that um, it should be open to other uh, entities that primarily serve people who are homeless um, so that that opportunity exists um, uh, sort of separate from a person's housing. Um, there was some sense that in certain circumstances, uh, people are re maybe reluctant um, to go to the residential, I'm not using the right term, but residential manager at the housing um, place because they are employed by the people who own the housing and um, felt like having somebody who is independent of that to assist them in those areas um, would be beneficial. So it doesn't say that it has to happen. It just says this: these are other entities that it, uh, if they can prove that they're doing this, they can apply for these funds as well. It just um, opens up some choice for individuals um, in that area. And, and again, committee... This is in section 12, which is the residence services program. And primarily the, the purpose of this was about an appropriation. Um, and this is this line, which is just as, as Representative Wood said, is expanding access to the potentially expanding or expanding the access to the potential funding um, in that section. Yes, thank you. Um, and then uh, the seventh instance of amendment is the same thing that I already spoke to, um, and that's uh, uh, removing the phrase reasonable percentage and inserting up to a cap of 5%. And again, um, uh, Commissioner Farrell did respond and I can forward that information um, if, you would, uh, if you would like. Um, interestingly enough, he did suggest a cap of 10% here up to a fixed dollar amount in both situations. So um, I uh, just, again, we did not have the ability to include that because the deal had already left our committee. Um, and again, um, the change from political to governmental um, is a change that we made. And then the final instance of amendment is um, speaking to um, uh, striking out, well, yeah, it's an amendment because we struck out all of the reporting requirements um, that was sort of cut and pasted from Act 81 um, because we are dealing with the reporting requirements in our um, 
emergency temporary shelter bill, H879. So all of that, there was several pages of reporting requirements that we said um, we will deal with in, in our bill uh, and we've updated them. So rather than amending in your bill and having it be in two places, um, we're gonna deal with it because it's gonna be an ongoing requirement of retirement for children and families. And then um, finally, um, we uh, were suggesting that um, this is existing law around neighborhood housing improvement programs and their ability to apply to a municipality to be exempted from um, uh, property tax on the value of the improvements made to the dwelling. Um, we wanted to make sure that um, that there was flexibility for municipalities that they could do that in whole or in part. So we inserted the in part um, piece and we inserted municipal um, given the uh, state of education um, taxes uh, being collected. Uh, we felt at this point in time that um, educational property tax um, should not be exempted to further uh, increase the pressure on that. Um, I understand that uh, Ways and Means is going to be dealing in their amendment with this section as well. So we don't really need to go into a whole lot about it. But um, and then we added or temporary to include um, those places that we are constructing as shelters. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not recognizing it. It's hard for you know, yeah. your chair. You're used to recognizing people. So um, my question is uh, in in my town. We make a distinction between municipal taxes and highway taxes. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you intended to make that just in your choice of the word municipal. Uh, no. So I don't. And, and this is going to be, I think I'm pretty yeah. sure this was amended uh, in the Ways and Means Amendment. Okay. Um, so um, I'll, I'll ask that question yeah, later then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And so as it stands this, so by you, in, in your ninth, um, in, this is part of your ninth instance of amendment. Correct. So you're replacing that whole reporting mechanism with this, changing the subject to this, this topic, which will then be changed, we think, in the next report. Yes. And that's it. My one question to you on the feeds, um, it was new language to us, or it was a new concept in the way that it was explained to us when a department was writing its statute that they would be able to receive this fee or this cost of doing business. The testimony, as far as I remember, didn't also didn't put a percentage on it. Um, it was unknown, like, it, but it had to do with the fact that we're moving the general fund dollars and not ARPA dollars that had a limit on the fees. So, so whatever ARPA funds were received, the, this other fee were, was cut out of it already or was, so they were trying to replicate that, but they came down at 10%. It's fine. What is, do, do you have knowledge based on your experience with this kind of language? I don't think that 10% is out of line in, in particular, given the fact that they, um, we just have a, we have a, a group of people upstairs, very conservative on the admin side of things. Um, um, uh, I'm just going to try to pull up for you. Um, uh, in my email, hold on just a second. I'll, I will um, pull this up so I can tell you exactly what they said. Hopefully. Uh, okay, so for VHIP, um, for program administration, the department may utilize up to 10%, 10 but no more than $250,000 annually from appropriations made to the department for the program. And then for the, uh, this was the manufactured homes infill, um, for program administration, the department may utilize up to 10%, but no more than 150 annually from the appropriation made to the department for the program. 
So I, I will uh, forward these to you. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that they're, uh, it, it is, pri if those dollar amounts are reasonable is, uh, you know, I guess subject to interpretation, but the fact that there is a, um, uh, the fact that there's a limit is probably not a bad idea. Well, it sounds right. It sounds like they're capping it so that if it's a $2 million program, right, then it's if 10% of that is 200,000. Right. So if it's a $4 million allocation or whatever, then it's a still two, it's still capped. Yeah. I mean, under the premise up to a certain degree, there is a, um, uh, if you're running a, a $2 million program versus a $4 million program, um, you know, it's really not probably going to be any additional, um, any additional administrative costs. Yeah. And I guess, I guess, and I think, you know, things have probably changed quite a bit from what the time when you were probably setting budgets, but to me, this almost sounds like, well, it, would this have been a, a request, you know, 10 years ago where, or, or, you know, before there was this question back and forth between state money and ARPA money, where an agency is asking separately as opposed to what their usual budget is. is that it seems, it, it strikes me, or I've always assumed that, well, if the budget, if, if, if this department requires X amount of dollars to run the department, isn't this part of their budgeting process? This seems to me like an extra amount on top of their salaries, benefits, rent, you know, equipment. Um, well, I can say that what what we have found um, in particularly looking at sort of, I guess what I would say, implementation of um, relatively new programs like VHIP is relatively new. Um, the manufactured infill program is relatively new. Um, that uh, we have um, undercut our state workforce um, in many areas. You know, we we actually uh, in our committee, which people might find unusual, have recommended adding positions for um, grants and contracts. Um, you know, to try to improve. Um, the um, ability of departments to respond to what they're uh, what we're asking of them to do. So um, I, I guess I would say that I, I think that we can only kind of like um, continue to add on responsibilities to various departments, you know, whatever they might be um, up to a certain point before we say that administrative there, there's additional administrative burden here. Um, and um, there, there's only so long that we can say to state employees, you can just, uh, you know, do more with less kind of, kind of attitude. So, um, we felt it was reasonable since there, there was, there was already a provision for reasonable administrative costs. We felt a definition of reasonable was in order. Great. No, thank you for that. I think it's, yeah, I think lack of capacity is effects in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, so committee, um, are you coming back? Are there any um, questions? Yeah, that are there I any questions for Representative Wood? Answer for people. Just I asked mine and it wasn't for Representative yeah. <laughs> Bond, did you have a question? Yes. It's okay. Quite. Um, it, it is what it is. Yep. Um, I have a question, and thank you for this presentation. Um, just about the individuals under the master lease. That seems like a good category to add. I appreciate of that. Um, did you say whether you had? I, I know that the funding for for VHIP is, is complex in the budget this year, and we're kind of relying on them to use uh, what's in the bank account essentially from last year's appropriation. Did this provision have testimony from the administration at all? I'm just curious, did this have their support or was there any pushback on adding a kind of another category to VHIP in the absence of sort of new funding? I'm just kind of curious what the nature of 
any testimony from the administration might have been on this provision, which I support regardless. Sure. Um, we did not have specific testimony about um, the provision of a master lease, the, the concept of the master lease. Uh, but um, we did have testimony from the administration um, regarding our uh, efforts to address homelessness mm -hmm. and the um, effectiveness of the VHIP program having been quite effective yeah. in reducing homelessness. And, um, so uh, no, with regard to that specific language, yes, with regard to the impact on people who are homeless. Thank you. And, and just a quick follow-up. Is that presuming that it's just sort of saying, if you are an individual under 25 who's gotten housing, let's say through a, a, an organization like Spectrum, mm -hmm. Um, that simply qualifies you uh, on the list of recipients of BHIP. There's not an expectation that that master lease would then be utilized with the home improver. So in other words, if I put up a new ADU and there's an individual from this category, mm -hmm. is the presumption that simply having been in that category under a master lease before means that they can now enter into an individual lease with me, or is the assumption that that master lease with would apply to this new ADU under VHIP. And do you see what I'm saying? Like, is it just a, is it just a categorical qualification or does it also say that that um, contractual reality of the of master lease would apply to the VHIP property? Um, if I'm understanding you correctly. Um, so what this is saying is that um, let's, the, the master lease, the master lease, um, the, the tenant, if you will, in a master lease, what we're saying is a youth service provider. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so that tenant, if you will, under this master lease um, is renting from the, the uh, person who owns the unit. Um, and it's being done on behalf of the individuals okay. under 25 who are in that right. youth service providers programs. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, I think that's clear. Yeah, I think it was just a question of if you kind of draw a circle of like the the master lease relationship and say, okay, well, you were in um, downtown Burlington in an apartment yeah. uh, facilitated by Spectrum. Now you qualify for this new ADU that's opened up because you were in that category. It sounds like both you qualify because you were already in that relationship and probably your tenant in the newly created ADU will also be the organization with the master lease and, and that relationship will continue. So it's less that you've just qualified, now you're out on your own. It's more that you've qualified, you're under 25, you're in the situation, and that sort of um, master lease tenancy will continue into your VHIP unit. Yes, I mean, yeah. it, it is. Um, so if you're in housing, that is, I, I think I'm understanding what you're, what you're getting at now. Um, so if you're in housing, that is, um, provided by Spectrum. So I'm going to use as an example in the budget that we'll be voting on, there is a homeless shelter for youth um, that we uh, in our committee had recommended for funding. Um, we were able to find the funding without it having to be new funding. So I'm just putting the plug in for that. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, in St. Albans. Okay. So, um, so if a youth um, is homeless and they're in that shelter. That's not a long-term place. It's meant to be a stabilization place, a place to help you get back on your feet. And, and Spectrum helps that youth find an apartment, you know, that's, you know, um, owned by, you know, Joe Schmo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and Joe Schmo says, well, you know, this person doesn't really have a history, you know, doesn't, hasn't really leased anything on their own before. Um, and Spectrum says, well, we're willing to enter into a master lease on behalf of that individual. Um, that's, that's, I think, the situation that you're referring to. So the person would be leaving Spectrum's, you know, shelter, um, you know, temporary housing situation. Spectrum helped them find uh, a more permanent home in a rental. And um, they are leasing on behalf of, of the youth. Um, and obviously the goal is that that transitions to the youth um, having that rental agreement themselves as they gain experience with that landlord and um, are able to um, undertake the responsibilities that they need to have as a, as a tenant. So um, it's, it's uh, an assistance to youth who 
um, many of whom are exiting DCF custody um, and kind of been out on their own for a little bit and then end up being homeless. And um, it's also worked um, the concept, not to complicate the matters, but the concept of master leases have worked well for um, people with mental health challenges. Um, I know Washington County Mental Health has uh, done a good job at master leasing. It, it We do run into complications with the um, with the use of um, subsidies um, and there's some complications, but they generally, um, you know, the, the agency uh, works them out. But um, for these youth, Spectrum is, for, I'm, we keep using Spectrum, I'm sure there are other youth agencies, but um, Spectrum has been very successful in getting youth employed, getting them sort of, you know, acclimated to understanding that they have responsibilities to pay their bills and, you know, to be a good tenant and what it takes to be a good tenant and um, to to acquire more permanent housing. So thanks for the question. Okay, any further questions for Representative Wood? Thank you for your consideration. Uh, well, thank, you. Just, thank you so much for your committee's time and um, making it that much better. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, and we'll see you out on it's going to be a delightful day for all of us, right? <laughs> I believe you're at least initially scheduled to be on at about 10.30 tonight, so. <laughs> yeah, I know. But our bill is the last on the list, as you see, the 879. See yes, yes. So, you know, uh, okay. it is what it is, you know. So. All right. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And the committee will hold up on a vote on this. I noticed, we've noticed that there's no um, Republicans at the table right now, so we won't have a vote. Um, after the, we had a conversation about this earlier this session, I went and checked with the clerk and uh, the speaker, and we are allowed to continue our conversation. Everything is recorded. It's not like the old days where things can be in secret. So um, we're allowed to continue the conversations that we're having without having members of the other party if they're choosing not to be here. Um, but I will not have a vote until, again, we will ask um, everybody to gather when we're, when we're uh, ready to do that. Uh, do you need to take a break, a short break, I should I assume? Oh, perfect timing. Okay. What are we talking about, puppy? <laughs> They're having the hearing right now. Okay. Um, How's it? So, Representative Kornheiser, welcome. Hey. Join us. Um, so, we just finished hearing from Representative Wood on their amendment. And again, committee, this is kind of a, um, a little bit different. Now, John, do you have the amendment? Can you put the amendment up on the screen? With the shorter amendment, it was a little bit easier to follow the instances of amendment, but um, I think with a lengthier amendment, we'd like to see it up on screen. But um, welcome. And if you would like to, you know, just, I don't know if you want to pitch in and wait till John's put it up on screen, or if you want to just start with your intro and go from there. Thank you. Um, Representative Kornheiser from Brattleboro, Chair of the Ways and Means Committee, here as the reporter of 829 and um, an amendment. Um, also want to offer that there will be a second amendment, which I believe amends our amendment coming um, that offers a number of fixes that were not, um, the math was not available for them when we um, voted this out. And so those are coming and I'll tell you about them as we get to them. Um, but as your committee knows probably more than anyone, but as we are all aware of as a state, um, our housing shortage has put a severe stranglehold on our economy, on many of our lives, on many of our well being, our ability to grow, our ability to welcome new Vermonters, our ability to hire, um, and many, you know, the amount of dollars that folks are spending out of their budgets on housing um, puts a severe um, restriction on folks' ability to do other things with their time and their lives and their livelihoods. And for anyone who's ever lived with that kind of stress on their budget, um, it really impinges your ability to even like 
engage in just like, you know, community activities or um, be as caring and open because like economic stress can really like, you know, even cramp your synapses on a day to day basis. Right. And you guys know that better than um, most people in the building. And I know you just heard from Representative Wood about um, the most extreme instances of that. And so given all of that and given um, the really great work that you all sent us on H829, um, which put forward this a full plan for what we can actually do about this problem. And we appreciate that you sent us that ambitious of a plan that after these years of, you know, us in some ways circling the drains on a problem, we have all said we need to be bigger and bolder and we need to get something done for Vermonters in this area because it's hurting all of us. And I think it's really exciting, um, despite the fact that it's making sort of an amendment sandstorm in my committee that we're working on both H829 today and um, all of the regulatory reforms that we're seeing out of the Energy and Environment Committee. It's thrilling that we're able to talk about those both in a blended way um, as much as possible, that we can see the reality, that we can do zoning and planning reform, long-term planning in this bill. Um, I know you also had a recent, I think we passed something a few days ago that also did more planning and data collection on housing. I think all of those bills together represent a real shift in how we're doing this work. Um, so you all send us bills because money needs to be found to do the things, right? That's the role of the Ways and Means Committee. And we are um, most of the time quite grateful for that honor and responsibility. Um, this week, it feels like a little much, but we are glad to do it. Um, you sent us a bill that would cost about $200 million a year. Um, your Committee on Ways and Means has spent the last, you know, really since the first week of the session, significantly diving in to what our tax responsibility looks at like across the state, where opportunities are for further tax fairness and where real opportunities are to raise revenue um, that would um, really be focused on folks paying their fair share. Um, and in doing that, we were able to identify approximately $100 million available towards your goal, um, your $200 million um, plan over 10 years. And so this amendment um, puts in two revenue sources to meet those needs in your bill, and then also um, cuts your appropriation by $100 million. So sorry about that. 128. Thank you. Um, and so let me explain to you what the revenue package is. Um, and then I think it might be probably easier for legislative council to talk you through the appropriations changes. Um, so as I've said in a few places, I don't know if I've said it to all of you, um, when we most of the ways that we change tax code or raise revenue um, are on a delayed implementation. And we know that we have an urgent need for housing money for this next fiscal year, right? Like we were able to have momentum, that momentum has, um, Without spending this year, we're really going to lose that momentum. The property transfer tax has a long time nexus to housing development, right? That is um, the transfer tax is essentially a promise um, that we put in place in 1967. Um, and then it was increased in 1988 as part of Act 200, um, which was um, some work done under Governor Cunin. And it was essentially designed and still holds, and I know that you all probably spend more time talking about this than we do, as a promise um, to Vermonters and to taxpayers that when sort of we start spending more money purchasing housing, we are also going to invest more money in building housing. And it's really like, it's a perfect promise that we put in statute. And yes, we not withstand it almost every year um, because such is, such as the kind of things that happen this time of year and at the end of the year. But that continued commitment is us reminding ourselves that when new housing is purchased, new housing needs to be developed. And that's really one of the ways we are able to have a Vermont um, where we have tremendous socioeconomic diversity in each of our communities. And that's really one of my favorite things about my town. It's one of my favorite things about Vermont that even every street in Vermont often has socioeconomic diversity. That is very unusual in this country. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons that we have the tight communities that we have. Um, 
So what we did is we used, in order to have money available this year and to continue to say that the, the transfer tax is really the most um, powerful promise that we have in statute, um, we increase, we shift the transfer tax around. So we are lowering the percentage um, or we're keeping, sorry, we are keeping the person. And I did, we worked on four amendments of four different bills before I walked into this room. So I'm a little more scattered than I would like to be joining you. There were no inflators put into the transfer tax when it was passed or when it was amended. And so there is an initial threshold, an initial bracket with a lower transfer tax. And that initial bracket is designed so that um, the first you know, few hundred thousand dollars of a home or a lower priced home um, will have a lower transfer tax. Um, there's also exemptions built in around folks who use certain loan instruments. We increased that bracket as both a nod to the increased cost of housing and to you know, continue on this promise to make <laughs> homes more affordable. Um, and so we increased that lower bracket um, up to $200,000. And then in order to um, both cover some of those costs of that shift in order to lower the price of the transfer tax for less expensive homes, and in order to raise more money long-term for um, the trust fund, we increased um, the transfer tax at $600,000. And so that is how we funded both um, the necessary revenue for this next fiscal year. And I think Representative Wood probably talked to you quite a bit about some of that need as well um, and to keep that momentum. And then also to really like continue to make sure that that promise was clear in statute. Um, the amendment that I will bring to you later um, once it is finished and my committee has a chance to look at it um, restores the percentages that are in original statute. Um, our initial amendment took away those percentages and put a real dollar amount equivalent with an inflator. Um, it was, we did it as sort of a mathematical um, shortcut essentially. Um, and since then have really recognized how important that sort of core promise between the transfer tax and the trust fund and those percentages being in statute are to so many people around the state. And so restore those percentages in a way that um, is sort of real dollar equivalent to the new money we're raising. Um, and so I'll bring that amendment to you when that amendment is available, but I just want to preview it for you. Um, that amendment also um, fixes a mathematical error um, to make sure that the clean water fund is kept whole. Um, it was a, an accident and I apologize that we reduced the money going to them. So those are those amendments. The second part, um, which is raises quite a bit more money um, is we added back a fifth income tax bracket to raise the marginal income tax rate by 3% for income over $500,000. And the Joint Fiscal Office estimates that this will raise $74.9 million in fiscal year 2026. The new rate impacts 1% of um, personal income tax filers, and it's a marginal rate, as is the transfer tax, meaning that it only applies on the value over the threshold of $500,000. Um, I can tell you a lot more about the need for this, um, but I think you all know it even more than I do. I don't think we can make any greater investment right now in Vermont's livelihood and in the strength and growth of our economy than investing in housing um, with our dollars. And so that is why your Committee on Ways and Means um, offered these amendments. And I'm sorry that I don't have the second amendment available to you right now. Um, time is a wild thing lately. And so I will bring that back to you when it's ready. Okay. Can you um, talk about the tax, the blighted um, property language that is oh, yeah. about that, please? Yeah, that was um, something that was offered to us actually from um, that language is, was in S311. Thank you. I knew it came, one, someone on my committee um, offered that as part of our work on this. Um, and we um, thought it made a lot of sense in this context um, and wanted to make sure that we were um, using the transfer tax um, in ways that were really adjusting to the needs of folks. 
um, and to the kinds of properties that we might see to build housing right now. Okay. Any questions for Representative Clash? Thank you for that clarification. Representative Brooks. Just a reminder about that section. Uh, oh, never mind. Okay. Representative Elder, and Justin Tangent. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Yeah. Um, middle income program. Now, I know that was part of the appropriation that, that came out, that $25 million. Uh, as it relates to the property transfer tax, some of the testimony we took in this committee was just that, you know, we heard from a builder in Virgins that, you know, the house they were building four years ago for 300000 is now 600000 So we've had this we've had this program where you could take that 600000 house and then through this middle income program, which was called Missing Middle, and now they're trying to rebrand it as middle income, maybe you bring that down to a lower number. Now, of course, your tax obligation is still going to be at the $600,000 level in terms of your municipal taxes. I'm assuming that would be the same for the property transfer tax, that it would trigger for the full build amount and not the amount, assuming we we have funding for the middle income program at some point, if that was happening and you had built a new house for say 625, and then you actually wound up buying it for 475 or something, that essentially on the margin above 600,000, that is what you would be assessed out of the property transfer tax. Is that right? So, um... <laughs> The property transfer tax, it, I'm going to answer something that was built into your question first. Um, the middle income housing development, I believe, is built into out years of this, um, of this amendment. It is just not in that first year because there was so little money available in that first year. And we need to really reduce, um, we need to build out our shelter capacity and a few other things before we can sort of jump into that. So that middle income housing development is built into out years and um, legislative council can talk you through that appropriations piece. To answer your more specific question, the property transfer tax, property transfer tax is levied on the sale price, whatever that sale price is, it is not the appraised price, it is the sale price. And your municipal taxes, which this bill does not respond to whatsoever, um, is levied on the appraised value. So what's the sale price in that middle income? Is it what the is it what the builder receives or is it what the homeowner pays? It's what the homeowner pays. And so we just don't count the sale that involves state monies. Is that right? Um, I think it depends on how the state money has come in. So if the state monies are so for instance, um, I just bought a car with a bunch of tax subsidies that are designed to sort of subsidize that. Um, those don't those come to me, but they look as if they come to the dealership. I paid the full price. And so I paid the sales and use on that full price, even though it didn't feel to me that I was paying the full price. So in the, in that middle income example, compared to that, you would essentially be paying on the, the amount included in the state subsidy. Mm -hmm. So you're going to, mm -hmm. yeah. So you would, be, state, hit, yeah. you state, would be hit by that kind of $600,000 threshold. If the state subsidy went to the buyer, then yes. If the state subsidy goes to the seller, then no. Um, do we know how the middle income program works? If the if the project go if the project to build is over the appraised value, which isn't determined until the end of the process, the building process, um, builder would receive subsidy. So if it, if it was if they spent five hundred thousand to build a home that cost that was going to appraise at four fifty. Mm -hmm. The builder would receive fifty thousand dollars. Right. There's percentages. Then says, well, if there's money left over out of a certain uh, uh, percentage of the purchase price that could be used for shared equity to help buy down the cost of the, the house. That money could be put forward to the buyer. So what I hear is that in the case where you're subsidizing the build, that has no impact that whether or not that has, if that has an impact on the sale price, then that buyer would pay the sale price and the property transfer tax would be levied on the sale price, regardless of how the builder found their way to the sale price. In the situation of shared equity, there are existing exemptions built into the property transfer tax related to um, VHCB, USDA, all of those um, supports for purchasing often first time homes. Um, we've touched before on 
um, refining the homestead, non-homestead property tax situation. And can you just very briefly talk about when that can happen? And uh, I guess mostly when, so, so that the property transfer tax can be refined. Um, yes. Yeah. So the, when someone purchases a property, they declare their intent on that property, but that has actually nothing to do whatsoever with the homestead or the non-homestead. Homestead and non-homestead designations are separate from grand lists, um, which is where the appraised value happens and where use is described. Homestead and non-homestead is a self-declaration that happens annually as part of someone's filing of their taxes and is how their property tax is levied. And your Committee on Ways and Means in passing H-480 last year, and I wish I could keep that act number in my head, but I'm just never going to be able to, um, began a process to better align our grand list categories with our homestead and non-homestead so that we can be more discerning in our property tax had a great section. None of that has anything. anything to do at all with the transfer tax, which is a one-time expense made at purchase as part of your closing costs. And is often either folded into the mortgage or even um, carried by the seller, even though it is levied on the buyer. Thank you, sir. Do you think middle income is going to get funded in out years? I'm just looking at this chart and I don't see it anywhere. Um, I don't know what chart I'm looking at this notes. chart. I just am curious if we've actually put that somewhere. I, I know VHIP gets funded at a greater rate. I just didn't think middle income got funded at all. Um, I remember it being out. intended to be funded, and I'm going to leave legislative council to describe that with you. I'm sorry. Go okay, on. that's fine. Yeah. It's just on this list for yeah. the 51.7 million. <clears throat> All right, any further questions? So um, the mechanisms for raising the funds are going to be an increase and a rejiggering a little bit of adjustments in the property transfer tax. To make it less expensive. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Fine. To make it less expensive, um, up to a certain home level. And then for uh, uh, funding in out years, there is an adjustment, there's an adding an extra um, marginal tax rate to our income taxes. Indeed, on the top 1% of earners. And so um, we will let the details of the rest of the amendment, we'll, we'll have John. You have, we'll let John run through them. Do you have an idea of when we might see the next amendment? I mean, we have a long day ahead of us. We're not going to do more until we we hear it. So I'm really hoping soon. It's with the editors, and then my committee needs to hear it. I, I'm hoping we do that at eleven. Okay. I know. Very soon. I know. That's how the day's rolling. Let me just a shoot. Let's see that. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions. Thank you for Thanks for all your work to send us the bill. No, Sorry we had to mess with it so much. Given the given the time of year it is, thank you for managing the bill. Yeah. All right. All right, John, if you could join us. I'll leave this chair pulled up. Thank you. On the record, I would like to thank John and all of the and staff that have done incredible work on this bill. Thank you. Hi everyone. Welcome, John. Good to see you. You're you're. I don't know. Are you worse for wear? Or are you, you okay? Thriving. Uh, <laughs> John Gray, Office of Legislative Council. Um, happy to jump in. So I think uh, Representative Kornheiser gave you the primary substantive changes here, but just to walk you through some of the pieces that you. I'll walk through the whole thing, but just to call out. The first section that is added here as um, an instance of amendment is reflective of the long-term plan. So you're talking about a legislative intent section. This is what sets out those out-year appropriations. Um, obviously, we can only indicate intent for future years, so this isn't binding. Um, but the intent is this approximately $900 million um, appropriation through fiscal years 
2026 through 2034 to fund particular programs um, to advance a long-term solution to Vermont's housing shortage. These track largely the programs that are already in the existing bill, but there are a couple of changes that I'm going to call out, and they're, to the extent that there are changes in the out years, I'll also call out when they are um, new fiscal year 25 appropriations that were not included in the initial bill that you guys passed out. Um, to jump down to the programs, first VHCB, this is the same language that was in the bill that you passed out, so nothing new here in subdivisions A, B, and C, same purposes, VHIP, we recognize land access and opportunity board. This is new. I don't think that we had reference to land access and opportunity board and then bill passed out of this committee. Um, there is both out year and fiscal year 25 appropriations to LAOB, which we'll come to. The state refugee office, same situation, out years and fiscal year 25. Resident services program, that's the new program that you guys are creating, initially created in the bill. Um, there has been a tweak to the appropriation there. And then for Middle Income Homeownership Development Program and the Manufactured Home Improvement and Repair Program. The fiscal year 25 appropriations that have been made in this committee have dropped out, so there aren't any for fiscal year 25, but there is this legislative intent to fund these in 26 through 34. Um, Office of Economic Opportunity that has both fiscal year 25 and um, long-term funding provided for um, that's related to operation services to address homelessness, um, but we'll come to the actual appropriations in a second, and then eviction prevention initiatives. Uh, that has not been touched at all. It's one of the few sections that remains the exact same funded throughout. These are the programs that were set up in S100. That's your um, Vermont Legal Aid providing eviction mediation services and that those sorts of programs. Same funding as was initially um, in the amendment passed out of here. There's this last call out in subsection C to say that in addition to the appropriations for those programs is the intent to support funding for temporary emergency housing until such time as is no longer necessary. The idea here is trying to set up as a transition to long-term solutions and away from temporary solutions. This theoretically could have been included as a subdivision 10 under those programs above, but given that this is trying to be called out as to the extent that funds are remaining, it's meant to be this is sort of a last piece. The focus is the intent is to focus on the long-term solutions as against those temporary emergency housing solutions. The next piece that you'll see is modifying the VHIP appropriation. So in the amendment that passed out of here, this was 6 million, and this is now bumped down to 1 million. The third instance of amendment, um, there are a few tweaks here. So this is these are the sections where the Middle Income Homeownership Development Program and the First Generation Home Buyer Program Appropriations for 25 have dropped out. Those are no longer part of the bill after this amendment. This amendment proposes um, 1 million to the Land Access Opportunity Board, an update to the VHCB uh, appropriation to go from 110 million down to 7.3 million. Otherwise, this language is consistent with what was in the initial bill. There's just some cleanup changes, which is why you see a full strike of that section. And then for the State Refugee Office, this is new. Um, 900,000 to fund the Agency of Human Services State Refugee Office for grants to support transitional housing for refugees. So that Land Access and Opportunity Board and the State Refugee Office appropriations, those were not programs that were contemplated in the amendment that you passed out. These are new. And then you've seen um, dropping from the 110 to 7.3 million for the VHCB appropriation. The next tweak that you see is for the Resident Services Program appropriation. I went from 6 million to 700,000. The manufactured home pieces have been dropped out. So this is sections 15 and 16, manufactured home improvement and repair program for infrastructure and mobile home repairs and the mobile home technical assistance appropriation, which went previously to CBOEO for their assistance services team. In their stead, um, there is funding for the Office of Economic Opportunity, 2.7 million. Um, in fiscal year 25 for grants for their loan in conjunction with federal emergency solutions grants consistent with HUD recognized continuum care program. Those grants go to community agencies to assist individuals experiencing homelessness by preserving existing services, increasing services, or increasing resources available statewide. Again, this is for individuals experiencing homelessness. This replaces your mere appropriation and then section 16, which was that technical assistance appropriation for mobile homes has dropped out as well. 
The next piece is, um, these are pieces that a colleague of mine drafted and you heard from Representative Kornheiser. I'm happy to go through these. I think you already heard the gist of these, but I'll try to add context to the extent possible. Um, your first piece here is modifying the property transfer tax. You'll see that the initial amount remains the same. There's been some cleanup to 1.25. What's added here um, is that marginal tax rate for value in excess of 600,000 on a property. So that's what you're seeing on lines two and three. And then the modifications that Representative Kornheiser was referencing related to cheapening the tax rate on value homes. That's what you see here starting at line four. In existing law, there's a tax imposed at the rate of 0.5% on that first 200K. I'm uh, uh, sorry, on the first 100K, that value has been boosted up to 200K. And similarly, uh, no tax in existing law, no tax imposed on the first 110K for that property transferred if, if purchased, obtaining a purchase money mortgage funded in part with a home and grant through the Vermont Housing Conservation Trust Fund or VHFA or USDA and rural development. Um, that threshold has been boosted as well. So that's what Representative Kornheiser is referencing and she talks about choosing um, in those instances. The instance where you're picking up additional funds is again, that in excess of 600K figure. Um, tax to be imposed at a rate of 3.25% of the value of the property transferred in excess of 600K. Same sort of changes down here, and I'm happy to come back to these. I will not be the best position to answer these, but we'll do my best um, to work through these. Um, and then there's a inflationary piece here to allow for adjustment of these rates. What would actually happen under this inflationary piece um, is that the values taxed at that lower rate would be raised meaning you'd have a greater value of home taxed at a lower tax rate. So it would be cheapening as inflation occurred. Um, so it's meant to track inflation there. Clean water surcharge, it sounds like there's gonna be an update on this piece from Representative Kornheiser, so I'm not sure that it's worth uh, going through these pieces, but there had been an adjustment here to again, boost those values um, so that that surcharge doesn't kick in until a greater value has been met. Okay, I'm John, I'm yes. I think that surcharge does apply to the first. There are there no surcharge. Okay, yes. Yep, yep got yep. it. Yep. So Thank surcharge you. of 0.2% on the value of property, um, subject to the property transfer type, except that, and this is setting that value, no surcharge on the first would have been 100K. This would be boosted to 200K, again, cheapening. Uh, and I can jump down to the income of this. So transfers are relevant for these purposes. And I think that this is where you're gonna hear the mathematical cleanups in the next amendment. Um, there's references to particular distributions and this is calling out specific funds um, that will be received from the property transfer tax to go to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund or the Municipal and Regional Planning Fund. My understanding from what Representative Kornheiser just represented is that these might be replaced with percentage figures rather than dollar callouts. Obviously, these are based on estimations as to what future year um, revenue would be. But this is where the funding is meant to arrive for those programs listed under the legislative intent section. The idea is boosting um, through the property transfer tax uh, revenue available for those purposes. Jump down. These are cleanup changes to reference instead of saying that that um, the trust fund should be comprised of a percentage call out. This is now referencing those distributions above um, those dollar figures, which again, it sounds like there's going to be a cleanup related to that in the next proposed amendment. Same here for the municipal and regional planning fund, just calling out reference to those particular dollar figures rather, rather than uh, discrete percentages. Lastly, uh, not last section. I'm sorry, can you scroll? Yes. Up? Just scroll the, scroll the. Let me get to that. Oh, okay, no, this is, this is, I'm sorry, that, that section, I didn't recognize it when I was driving by, but that's general fund. Just for future reference, this is what the general fund is composed of. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the reason I believe, and again, I didn't draft these sections, that the 33% is deleted is if we're calling out particular dollar figures, just trying to align. These are flow through changes from the other modifications. 
we heard about this exemption from property transfer tax for transfers of abandoned dwellings. The transferee certifies will be rehabilitated for occupancy as principal residences and not as short-term rentals, provided the rehabilitation is completed and occupied not later than three years after the date of the transfer. If three years after that date of transfer, it hasn't been completed and occupied, then the tax kicks in at that point. So after that three-year period, if that abandoned dwelling hasn't come online, um, the tax is still imposed, so that exemption would drop out. Abandoned here is real estate owned by a municipality and acquired through condemnation or a tax sale, provided the real estate has substandard structural or housing conditions, including unsanitary and unsafe dwellings and deterioration sufficient to constitute a threat to human health, safety, or public welfare. Completion is to be fit for occupancy as principal residence. Principal residence is a dwelling occupied um, as the individual's domicile during the tax year the property owner owned or for rental renter rented under a rental agreement other than a short-term rental and then rehab that's your extensive repair it is extensive repair reconstruction or renovation of an existing dwelling beyond normal and ordinary maintenance any repairs or replacements with or without demolition new construction or enlargement the last piece is i believe this is the last piece the personal income tax um, so you're going to see modifications to the table here. My understanding from speaking with uh, my colleague Kirby um, is that these sorts of modifications to the table at the lower rates um, is a regular occurrence that these would be updated. Um, but the piece that is new here is your over 500,000, um, adding that 11.75, so a boost of 3% at the highest um, income bracket to your marginal tax rate over, over 500,000. Again, you'll see this here, boost of 3% um, for that highest income tax bracket. And I'm happy to slow down if you guys are trying to catch all the... Representative Link. Thank you, Chair. John, is that 79.950 based on AGI? So I think what it does is it just reflects if you added up all the brackets preceding it, so because you're going to have different marginal tax rates on each bracket, right? It's adding up all those to say this is the figure that you're paying out of those. And then for your highest bracket, so taxable income over X figure, you now have this figure in place. So I'm not sure the relationship to AGI, but I think it's just adding up the brackets below and telling you what those figures would be. Again, this is outside of my area, but that's my understanding of the way that marginal tax rates are added up is that. I thought it was over 500,000. So so we're getting into the unmarried versus Got and it. let me ju let me jump up just to be clear. So married individuals filing joint returns surviving spouses if taxable income is your highest bracket is over 500k. I see. Yep. Individuals it's 410. Yep. So heads of households got this 455 and then unmarried individuals you're looking at the 410. So Got it. Thank you. I frankly don't check a fine on the difference in categories but obviously that's existing law. So 500K is in law, it's just for those married um, individuals filing jointly. For those filing separately, you're looking at presumably the same, uh, oh, separately, over 250, so makes sense. And again, in all instances, you're boosting that uh, marginal tax rate by 3%. Um, if you're filing separately, it's over 250. Do you each have to hit 250? Or does one of you have to hit 250? So like you're filing separately and one of you makes 50 and one right. of you makes 250, right. you're going to pay 11.75 on the 250? Or is it going to take into account the year? So the person who's filing solely and has 50K is not going to have any funds available that are going to trigger the 11.75. I get the question about categories. Like if what's kicking you in is that you're part of a couple and one is triggered into this because they're over 250K. But I think that for the one filing with 50K, they don't have any income that would even fit the 11.75 like sure. to, to fit into that. So sure. I don't think it's a- But their total income would be 300,000 in that case. And on 250 of it, they'd be hit at the top rate. That, that I So, I mean, that's something you should talk to your accountant about. That would just be a filing mistake in my view, but that's how the law is written. That's my answer. Again, this is, yeah. And there's plenty of rooms to make mistakes in the tax code. I have a question when it's appropriate. Um, are you available for questions? Or do you want to go through the last two pages? I, I, I can jump through these. I don't have a lot to add beyond just scrolling through and letting you guys see the figures since you haven't had a chance to see it. Again, this being outside of my 
uh, subject area. This is shared less. This was shared with the committee. It's been online. For okay. Time. Okay. So um, then I may not. So effective dates, you'll see some pieces here related to uh, clean water surcharge kicking in at different points because um, there's actually two sections related to clean water surcharge. But understanding from Representative Kornheiser is that might be cleaned up in the next instance. Um, and that personal income tax brackets to take effect on January 1st, 2025, so not immediately, and apply to taxable years beginning on and after uh, January 1st, 2025. So that's not immediately coming into effect, the modification to the personal income tax brackets. And with that, I think that's tied the content here. Okay, Representative Elder. Um, I just, the intent section, the 900, yes. 900 million, um, and, I, and I know that, you know, feel free to say you don't know on any of this stuff. I'm just looking at 900 million divided into nine years and coming up with 100 million per year because that's easy math. Um, and I'm seeing that we raise a total of 92.4 million in year two, but we don't apply 40 million of it to this issue. Did they talk about that at all there? I'm just kind of wondering if we're trying to send 100 million a year and we have 92 million next year what we're doing with the other 40. I know, I know what we're doing. We're, well, we're not doing anything formally because we can't, but we're saying we hope it will go to this list of things adding up to 51 million and then the balance will go to the general fund. But that just seems to be in direct conflict with this intent. Is that something that- It was that? not discussed as can, can I for that. I yeah. think I understand the question. I can get us part of the way there. I can't. The forty million dollars is being uh, the forty million dollars, I believe, or whatever it is, is being transferred to deal with GA issues. That's going to be talked about in eight seventy nine. So the funding for eight seventy nine for the for the emergency housing programs is part of the tax rate. I think that's what I heard in the last couple of days when we get. Representative Kornheiser back on this other amendment. Mm -hmm. We should ask directly because that's that's yeah that would be good because it's just it's not on the list. Right. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like the bill says this stuff's for this list, and then we're taking almost fifty percent of it and saying not going to the list. Mm -hmm. So that's you know yeah. if you did that every year, you're going to have four hundred fifty million dollars, not nine hundred, and so it's just like. It just seems a weird thing to be silent on. Okay. So to corroborate your concern, uh, uh, it is merely a legislative intent section. To, so to the extent that there is a disjunction between where the funds actually go and what's evidenced here, no requirement, obviously, to follow what the legislative intent says. Sure, sure. Uh, I mean, that's clear, but just to call out, yeah, right. you could see a disjunction and it be... And notion of notwithstanding, which is always a right. bugaboo about special funds, like right. this one in particular, right. is it can never be eradicated. And I understand we can't, you know, bind a future legislature. It just seems odd to me to have an intent where you say, we're going to put 900 million at this thing over this schedule at this rate, and you do the math and it's 50% of that number. That just seems, I know nothing's binding, but why say anything at all? Let's, let's ask the question of the chair when she comes back. I, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I get what you're saying. I don't know what, I, do, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I doubt there will be a satisfying answer. I'm just calling it out. Representative Chisholm. Um, John, I don't know if you can address this, but page eight. Okay. Yes. So the heading there is, uh, um, section 9602A is amended to read. Yes. Is this going to be the duplicative sections? Is that the yes. question? So uh, I think the answer to this, um, and again, I didn't draft these, but this was an, an intentional choice to do this, to have what seemed to be duplicative and conflicting language in that 0.2%. Yes. So this is intentional from tax colleagues. My understanding is that different surcharges would be coming into effect at different times, maybe an existing law. And so what you would be amending with these sections, depending on when they come into effect, like that last effective date relates to 2026 or 2027, you would actually be amending a different law with the same section reference. Does that make sense? Um, 
because of the clean water surcharge is independently being modified elsewhere. But that's my understanding is that you would actually be modifying different language with the same section call out in different years. So the 0.2% surcharge is, is in effect now. And for example, and I haven't read the effective dates mm -hmm. line to this, but this could mean that next year or in, at some future date, the 0.04%. I think, I think that that's right. I, I don't want to, given that I... The numbers, the, the, the clean water surcharge does change. Yeah, and I, I just do want to, I think the best answer I can give to that is it is an intentional decision with an awareness. Um, and so I understand it to be a rational choice reflecting that there will actually be different language in effect during those years. I can't opine beyond that, but it is intentional. It's not an oversight. But it also sounds like these are going to be changed in the next amendment anyway. So I think that may drop out. Okay, thank you. Would maybe you can provide some insight? I mean, <coughs> I'm obviously making assumptions. Um, the VHIP mm -hmm. appropriation? Yes. For fiscal year 25. What the heck were they thinking? Oh. <laughs> I, I can't really. Um... I would love to have a committee discussion about this one. I feel very strongly about this cut um, to the appropriation, which is and was originally my concern when we didn't necessarily prioritize some of the appropriations we were requesting. Um, I, I, I've talked to Commissioner Farrell uh, and there was a concern that bringing the appropriations from six million down to a three million would end um, the program in spring of next year. Bringing it all the way down to one million pretty much ends the program in January of twenty twenty five. Uh, this alone will I will not be voting for this amendment. Um, I would love to see us change it back to six million. And that's as a school Republican asking us to spend more money, like begging. Um, I, I think this is absolutely disgusting that this was cut. And I'm actually very upset about it. Representative Elden. Yeah, I, I'll just offer a review. In speaking with Representative Bloomley, my understanding, and I'm sure you know this, was that there was a, a balance of 18 million in the program's coffers. And so when the original cut was to three, mm -hmm. I did go speak with her and, and, and kind of expressed a desire to try to keep that as high as possible. I was surprised to see it come down as far as to three. one from three, but I assume the same rationale was. Uh, was being used, that they have money in the bank, essentially. Um, in terms of when the program will end with that money in the bank, that is, I had not ever heard about that. Um, but for what it's worth, that is something I chased down with Rep Bloomley, and that's what I was told a while ago, although again, at that time, it was gonna be through. I, I definitely appreciate that insight and you working with Rep Bloomley on that. <clears throat> is there anything we can do besides offer an amendment on the amendment? Um, the appropriations for this year, mm -hmm. what are we in fiscal, we're, we're budgeting for fiscal year 25. Yeah. Our original asks, 170 some odd million dollars. Mm -hmm. And the, by changing the, if we change the, property transfer tax that will raise $17.5 million, which is dedicated here. So to go from 170 plus million to 17.5, it's really disheartening. And um, is there anything you can do? The, all of, I mean, people from the money committees will tell you that everything is calibrated. Um, an amendment is certainly possible, but they will say to you or to anybody who offers one is, where is the, where is it coming from? 
Like we can't just add five million dollars with um, without paying for it. This is very much the way our world was before COVID, for what it's worth. But it's um, I, I can say I appreciate your. I'll say disappointment in the cut. Um, as am I, all of it. We're, we are, because of the financial situation, even with tax increases posed, we are um, ending a lot of momentum on a lot of programs. This one, the middle income program. Yeah, I, you know, it's, we say it over and over and over and over and over again, we're in the middle of a housing crisis. Often we're told we have to put our money where our mouth is and this amendment doesn't do that. We know that we have works and to, I expected a cut. I didn't expect a cut like this. And to me, it's just unacceptable. Uh, Representative Labor than Elder. Thank you, Chair. Hypothetical. If we were to build on Caleb's numbers and back it off from the 900 million to the 90, and put in just one clause tied to the New England CBSI going forward. you would probably slowly increase the revenue from the state coffers that it would be sustainable and probably approved by the people who are paying the bill. When I look at my constituents, I have a significant number of mobile home manufacturing homes that really benefit from FIHA, weatherization, et cetera, conversion of that, getting away from kerosene heat and going to cold weather heat pumps. Well, those prices will all go up, CPSI too. So you'd be keeping in track with the cost, but not putting a term limit of 10 years on it. It'd be any. So if the CPSI goes up, so it's prohibited. Are, are you referring to like the intent, the intent, the intended um, appropriations? So that if we said $90 million a year this year, which is, which is not, it's 17.5. Um, Pick the number. Caleb said 45 of that, really not there. 40. Right. Yeah, I don't. Given that number, you can I, build on that. I think, well, there's two, two things that I don't have an answer. Um, we're not appropriating money out officially. We're, this mm -hmm. is an intent. So, if there's, um, so we can't, I don't see the putting a number on because we don't know how much money will actually come in over time. So I don't, I don't know how I would handle that, that question. Um, Representative What does CPSI stand for? The chair. Consumer price. Consumer price index, but regionalized to this part of the country. What does the S That's stand for? I know what CPI is, but what is the S? We do all of ours at the select board, same one. Okay. I'd have to go and Google the S and the I. I almost feel like, and I was going to ask this anyway, um, we, we could tie it to try that to um, basic needs budget. Well, we are getting it. Okay. Um, 
the answer, the short answer is if there's, if it's something you're interested in adding an amendment for, um, we would need to have somebody from JFO or whatever to sure. understand it. Um, it's something that if you would like to have testimony on it, we can try to get it in. We don't need to get it in before second reading. It can be done before third reading, right? Today's second reading, um, which would give you or anyone else time to track down the, the, the right people to write the amendment if you're interested in putting it forward. I mean, I'd be interested in hearing about it and about where it fits. Um, so that would be um, talking to a tax attorney, probably Kirby <coughs> Keaton. Is that his name? That's right. You probably want to talk to Pat Tetterton as well. Yeah. I'm not totally clear on the idea if it's tied to the to the future year appropriations, just the legislative intent, or if it's tied to revenues, uh, which would have a would be a much bigger um, thing to think through, I think. But those would be the people to talk to for sure. It's a clarifying question. Yeah. Um, we have not heard from House Appropriations on their amendment. They did technically vote an amendment, but it is identical to the Ways and Means Amendment. So I was confused as to why theirs is set up the way that they did. I understood that they just voted to approve essentially the Ways and Means Amendment. That's the way that I understood. Right. I, I, they redrafted it as its own thing. Like, so it's sitting in their folder hmm. as their draft amendment. Now, we all know Ways and Means did the appropriations, and I suppose maybe this is a CYA situation so we can pretend that appropriations did it. Maybe that's impugning, but I just don't understand. It sounds like you don't understand. They, they didn't do anything. They didn't do anything, but on their website, they've got a, they've got an amendment that is with a vote. I mean, they voted on it. They, they voted and I, yeah. They voted. They didn't make any changes as what their, as what their reports. But I, it just would have been nice to hear from the appropriations committee about this because basically we've had all these appropriations changed by a committee that doesn't have that in their jurisdiction. Can you text, um, can you text Representative Bowling and see if she's available? Just, just, I'm just pointing that out. It's just, a, it's just a weird, a weird thing. You no, know, we had some back and forth on it, and um, we just get policed on the jurisdictional stuff a little bit. And my goodness. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> no, it's we will have her come up. Any further questions right this minute for John? So the status of what we've heard this morning is that we've heard Representative Wood's amendment. And I think we, um, if Representative Krasnow comes back, I'm assuming that Representative Parsons will not be in committee. Um, Representative Lamont is not here. So we can have a conversation about Representative Wood's amendment and a possible vote right now. Emily. And Iran is texting Emily right now. Oh, She's, um, and on this particular amendment, we still need, we have two deep questions to ask from the chair of Ways and Means, is that right? <laughs> I've, I heard two deep questions of clarifying the 450,000 or you've asked the question and regard, we, we would like to ask that question. Or oh, I'm sorry, about the 50, about the, the 40 million. Yeah, the 40 million. Yeah, just kind of that mismatch between intent and what appears to be out your funding intent, uh, knowing that none of it's binding. Yeah. yeah and and um, I don't think I need to hear the answer on that to vote on it, but it is a question that's bouncing around my well we are going to have cavity. her back because um they have they're gonna, they're not going to vote on their amendment until noon and so um are we voting is this going to the floor today yes it may be at like three o'clock in the morning at the rate yeah. you know depending on how 680 i'm just being facetious but um but far, until we get this, so so yes, it's going up at some point today. I mean, six. We're scheduled to go second. 
but second could be three o'clock or four o'clock or you know however long six eighty seven goes. We might not all be as overjoyed as the chair of ways and means that we're taking them up concurrently. <laughs> I, it's the bunny week. Um, the hero of the great British baking show. Um, <laughs> the um, <laughs> again, uh, ways and means is not voting on their bill on their amendment, the second amendment, um, which is supposed to be providing correctives until noon. So we would come, we would have to arrange a time for her to, for Representative Kornheiser to come back and explain that. I think that we would, um, and we're on the floor at one o'clock, is that right? Representative Bloom is not available on the Capitol. So it just, so we will set a time. I don't know what it can be right this minute, but we will set a time. We will have permission to be off the floor. I know we're all very interested in 687. So I need to arrange a time with the speaker to have us off the floor. Do we want to meet as soon as 1245 to check in? Does that work for everybody? Yes. I mean, if we if we vote one bill out, if we if we vote one amendment out now, and then if we just schedule our time to check in or to be here at 1245, and I will work with Ways and Means and with the Speaker's Office to find out, I'm assuming that. We'll need whatever time we need. There's no, I can't rush it, but I am all again. I just want to all speak. Um, <clears throat> aware of other people's wants and needs in terms of the, um, it's on the floor. It's a caucus the whole at noon about the oh, budget. Shit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Oh. Yeah. All right. Thank you for reminding me of that. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> um, all right, but that's still twelve forty-five. I will. We will text around, and I will try to find the right time for for us to come back and finish the conversation on, so we can answer the questions on two ways and means amendment. We haven't, Emily. We haven't heard on the second ways and means amendment. It's not being voted on until noon. So what we're going to embark on now is just a quick conversation to find out if there's any further conversation about Representative Woods' amendment, and then we'll take a break until we can come back on those other two amendments. How's your puppy now, Bill? It went great. Woof. <laughs> <laughs> it went nice. Good. <laughs> All right. Um, does that work for everybody? Great. Yes. And again, Representative Labor, if you want to chase down information on a possible amendment about CPSI, please do. Um, and if that's the case, you know, we'll consider just find out what you find out and then and then pretty late in the game. What's that? I would say this is pretty late in the game. It it is, but it's also it, if it's something that you want. To find out direct, we can't take testimony right this minute from right. JFO to find out. Or, right. but if you want to chase down Kirby, you won't have to look far. He'll he'll be around. Um, and also Pat Titterton, just to just to ask the question, I can't answer that. I can't answer that directly about except to say those are out. Those are out possible. Um, and I mean CPSI or CPI is talked about with respect to how it was being. PCT was being determined. And if you find out that it's too complicated for this minute, then we we move it down and find a way to address it. Any okay, so changing gears back to the human services amendment. Any further comments or, um, on that amendment? Uh, then what's our pleasure? Uh, I make the motion, but I don't have it in front of me. 
You can make a motion to approve the oh. Representative Woods Amendment. I'd like to make a motion to approve Representative... Oh. Is that what we do when we do... when? How do we right. report no. that? <laughs> now I'm freaking out. Uh, <laughs> it's a struggle. Oh, yeah. struggle. We found it in favor. We're finding it in favor. We're not approving. We're finding okay. what we are, but we're finding it in favor or not. But your choice. Um, I'd like to make a motion to find... Uh, Human Services Amendment favorable. Here, second. Okay. Any further conversation on the Human Services Amendment? Okay. Seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Okay. Those opposed. So we have three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, two, two. All right, thank you. Um, we'll be in touch. While everyone is, yes, what it is, it's just covered with.